following on um, uh, from the, the 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 stint that you did with Alice, and obviously the, the the solo career took off, and then you took the role of a side man again, and uh, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, joining uh, UFO. So um, that right. when was that? Two thousand and three. Right around that time period, yeah, is when I first heard about it and we started uh, started talking with Phil on the phone and we started putting ideas together and discussing things. And yeah, that's, I thought, you know, maybe this will last like three, five years or something. And here we are 20 years later and it's like, wow, how did 20 yeah. years go by that fast? But the difference in the UFO situation is they weren't looking for just a hired hand guy. Phil was looking for a guy to... That, wrote music and he yes. wanted somebody to collaborate with. And it was much different than the Cooper experience where I was just a hired hand side mm. guy yeah. doing live shows or whatever. This was being an actual member of the band and contributing as a writer. And that's what made the difference. So co correct me if I'm wrong. Wasn't there, um, cause Michael Schenker had done the album sharks and then he pulled out of the tour. Is that correct? Did you? Did oh you? man, if, I don't know exactly what happened, <laughs> but there was some big disagreement on the road, and they ended up fighting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't so know. That's you, just like a soap opera there. But did you join that tour, or did you come in for a complete? No, no. This was like, I think a few years later. I would guess. I don't ex know the exact timeline, but they were looking for a guitar player, and I think initially Phil wanted to find somebody that he could work with in England. And for whatever reason, you know, couldn't find a guy. And then I thought, okay, we'll expand it to all of Europe. And what just wasn't finding the right guy. And then someone recommended me, you know, a mutual friend. And I sent him a CD with some of my songs. Mm. And I heard back like 10 or 12 days later that he wanted me to do it. And it's like, oh, wow, this is really cool. I didn't quite expect it. But, you know, pretty soon we started talking, working on songs. And so, uh, it kind of happened. How many albums is it that you've done now with with UFO? Um, honestly, I don't even know. Maybe like six. Six, I think. Yeah, I, w I was wondering if it was six. Yeah, it is six. I have it in my notes. Is it? You know, yeah. I don't even know how many solo records I have because I don't tend to keep track of that. And, you know, I forget my songs. I can't even name the songs that are on a particular record because I kind of get totally involved with it when I'm writing and recording. And then after it comes out, I just kind of forget it and I move on to the next thing. I don't even pay attention. And often when I go do live shows, I have to kind of revisit the old stuff mm. and think, oh, what song can I do live? I have to relearn the stuff. I tell you, I, one thing I discovered today, might be off point, was Time Odyssey is not on iTunes. I Last I checked, it was partially on iTunes, and I don't know why that would be. No, I can't find today. It was really? not on iTunes. Yeah, so is maybe it... they banned me. <laughs> maybe it had some uh, some unsavory lyrical content. Exactly. <laughs> Too many notes for yeah, a second. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, were you a fan of of Michael Schenker prior to to joining UFO? Definitely, he was. I, one of my influences as a kid. Um, I was a big UFO fan. I had the Forset record, Lights Out, uh, Obsession. My friend who lived right up the street had the live record. So yeah, it was definitely, yeah, he was one of the guys when I was a kid. So, um, and when and, you, you know, like maybe some of the classical stuff came from him too, mm, you know, because yeah. he was exploring, you know, that area as well. So when, when it comes to, to because I, I had this uh, conversation with Steve Morse uh, recently about playing with Deep Purple, um, he, he was quite funny. He said to me that when he joined Deep Purple, the fans showed their, uh, so, uh, their, their appreciation of, his, of him joining uh, with beer. He said uh -huh. that literally he would be dodging you know, the bottles when he, uh, when he, when he was on stage and he, you know, sort of, well, he's been in it now th 30 odd years. I think he's, he's been with them longer than, uh, than Richie Blackmore. But something that's always interests me with, with you joining a band like that, because I, I, I've obviously never had the opportunity to do something like that. I've, I've, I guess I played with artists who are still the guitar player and, and back them. But it's or played shows where I have to play that artist's music. How do mm -hmm. you how do you find coming into such an established 
uh, environment as UFO and, and playing it. And do you have, do you feel a, a certain amount of pressure to keep the legacy, uh, you know, in, intact and play everything note for note? Or do you, do you have the, the freedom? I, you know, I, I, I don't I'm know. Both. Yeah. I mean, there are certain things that are part of the song and you can't not play that, those melodies or whatever, mm. like the melody and love to love, the solo. And then there are areas where like, whether it be Paul Chapman or Michael Schenker, if they had played these songs live, they would be improvising in certain sections too. Yes. So, you know, I think certain sections have to be improvised and felt in the moment on stage. That's what we all do as players. And uh, you just have to decide, decide what are the important things that need to be kept in the song. And sometimes you just play within the spirit of the song. You know mm. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So you just kind of gauge that and go with it. Well, it's like Steve said, you know, with Deep Purple, they're like, just do your own thing. You don't have to copy everything. And he was, he told me, like, yeah, like, but how do you not copy the solo in Highway Star? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. How, how did you find the fans when you joined? Did you have it? Was there any of that kind of uh, well, anim animosity? You know, for the most part, they've been accepting and pretty good, but there's some hardcore fans that you know it's the opposite yeah you know you could put jesus in the band and they don't care you know they just want it the old <laughs> way yeah and that's okay with me um yeah whatever i just like like being in the band it's a lot of fun and you can't win over and everybody you just mm. won't yeah, but it's it must be an, inc an incredible sort of feeling to be part of such an iconic band you know they are uh, a seminal uh, a, a British rock band part of that that genre and to have contributed and, and written uh, you know music and and be part of that legacy is a is a huge achievement yeah definitely it's been a great thing for me great opportunity and it's been a lot of fun just loads of good experiences over the years and you know everyone in the band gets along really mm. well for the most part yeah, there's always going to be little things when you're kind of in a marriage, which being in a band is like being in a marriage. Yeah, when you're on tour together for like 30 days on a tour bus. You know, there's going to be little things, but that's all part of it. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, is the, you have some gigs coming up with UFO this summer? Is that still happening? Because I saw that. Yeah, it starts in July. Yeah, and is this going to be the final outing of the band? Do you think? Yeah, that's the plan. You know, we were in the middle of the big farewell tour yeah. and we were halfway through it and uh, COVID hit and kind of, you know, put a halt to that. And I've yeah. been home for two years. We haven't done any shows. And uh, finally, we're going to go back out and continue the final tour, which starts in July and I guess ends in October. Uh, you know, some of us want to continue and, you know, Phil's just kind of ready to... You know, put, yeah. Uh, put an end to it because he's he's done it for so many years, and you know I could totally understand that. So, what would be the chances of there being uh, a, a a new singer in the band to continue the legacy? Uh, I don't think I don't think we could do that. He's like the voice of the band, and he's he's the only guy who's continuously been in the band over the years. Right. He's the common thread. You know, it's pretty. It's his band, and yeah. you know you can't do that without him. But perhaps I can give him a few pints and talk him into doing another chore. Yeah, yeah. You can't. It can't be the end. You Come know. on, Phil. Have <laughs> a few <few> drinks. <laughs> have another beer. So talking about touring and uh, um, uh, playing live and in the studio, uh, this is the bit that all of my viewers get really interested in: is gear. Great. So what guitars are you currently playing? Because uh, I don't know whether I'm able to talk about this or not, but you're not playing, sure. you're not with Dean anymore, are you? No, I haven't been with a guitar company for a while, and I've just started playing Kramer, believe it or not. Or not. Uh, yeah. And I've... lately I've been playing this guy quite a bit, the SM1. I used it a bit on the new record. Yeah. And I have a Beretta that I used a little bit. And ironically, when I was younger, I wanted to get a guitar with a Floyd Rose, and I was playing a Kramer Pacer back in the day, mm. back in the Spotlight days, and on the first Vicious Rumors record, 
before I started working with Ibanez, so I've in a way come full circle back to Kramer. Yeah, I got my first Kramer last summer. Um, I've been through my my work with Mesa Boogie. Boogie got bought by Gibson. Yes, I know that. Uh, who also Kramer. Yeah, and so because of all the Lick Library DVDs I've done for years, the, the, the uh, Gibson are doing this teaching app, and Boogie mm-hmm. said. It was it was really crazy that it was actually being developed here in Stockholm, and and Boogie were like, you should check our our guy out that does our videos, and uh, mm-hmm. so the next thing I knew, I ended up doing some work with Gibson, and awesome. uh, and so they gave me a, a Kramer eighty four that I've been using, and it's fantastic. Yeah, I have one of those, and the lucky thing because they're owned by Gibson, I get to play other things. So I'm going to grab something real quickly. I actually this Epiphone SG. Oy. Nice. You know, very uh, reasonably priced. And I use this a lot on the new record. This, I've always wanted an SG. Yeah. And I picked this one up. And just the cool thing about being with Kramer is I get to play some of this stuff too on stage. And it's yes. all part of the same Gibson umbrella. Yeah. So that's yeah. kind of a... I've got a, I've got an SG in, uh, in the other part of my live room that I've been using on some, uh, video. It's, it's a three pickup SG with the, the same whammy bar. How do you get on with that bridge? How do you find that bridge? You know, I don't use a whole lot of whammy when I play this guitar for whatever reason. I just kind of like that, you know, the two humbuckers and the different, yeah. the Gibson scale. Yeah. And there's tons of tones with both of those on where you start tinkering with the volume controls. Yeah. I have a, a song on my new record where I used it for all the main melodies and it's kind of an Allman Brothers kind of sound. Yeah. That's, well, and, you know, I went for both pickups on and kind of went for more of the Dickie Betts kind of thing and it really sounded great. Yeah, I've got a, a Les Paul Modern uh, that <laughs> is, is kind of my go-to Les Paul for doing the tuition with. And it's mm-hmm. got the the asymmetrical neck and it's got the the cut out on the heels so you can get up on the high frets but it's got all the mm-hmm. push, push pull pots with coil tap and phase uh-huh. reversal and stuff you can get some some pretty cool Is sounds that the jimmy page kind of setup yeah but yeah it does that thing it, you can you can pull up the uh the tone pot on the the neck pickup and it will reverse the phase of the neck pickup but you can also pull up the volume pots and it will split the coils but if you've got like some crazy setting and you want to get to the bridge humbucker, you just pull up the, the tone pot for the for the uh, the bridge pickup and it just goes... You're always tr- back to home base. Yeah, home base, you know, volume on full. Uh, so That's it's a, the Steve Morse kind of thing, I think. He yeah. has that one switch that always puts the bridge on or yeah, maybe yeah. it's the bridge in conjunction with other things. Yeah, he, yeah, he can always flick that to get back to, get back to the, the, the sound. So you mm-hmm. uh, is that an official... Um, agreement with with kramer or is it something that could yeah it's an official thing at this point in fact i'm going out to do a clinic for them in a few weeks and we haven't like really talked about it or made like a major announcement or anything like that but i we've definitely been talking about doing a signature model in oh, the wow. future kind of a ways down the road but yeah that, that'll be cool so talking of signature models we i mentioned this in the uh, in the email uh, when we were chatting, is the is is the Ibanez? Have you got it to hand? I have it ready because you talked about it. So here, oh man, there it is! Look at that. You know, when we started working on these guitars, it was me and uh, Mace Bailey and Rich Lasner at Ibanez, and they were just like an hour's drive from me. Mm. So I'd always go up there, like probably like once a month or something and just hang out. It was really cool that it was so close in Ben Salem, VA. But we built, Mace built three by hand. Mm. I could be wrong. He built the first one by hand and that one ended up being painted blue, like a a teal blue. And that was in my car that got stolen in New York. Right. Actually, my girlfriend's car at the time. I never got it back. I've never seen it Line, and it was a one of a kind. It was he carved it from hand, oh. and that was missing. So the number one I haven't seen since 1990 or 91. Oh, shit. And then I think this is one of the first two bodies that Ibanez actually copied, you know, Mace's shape that he mm. came up with. 
And because that's, believe- that's a long, a non locking tremolo on that, isn't it? Yeah, this is what I always used back in the day was the Floyd Rose with no fine tuners. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And Guthrie released, you can get yeah. these again. Well, Guthrie, but at the time, you couldn't. Yeah, Guthrie and has that on, on Guthrie has that trim on his signature oh, Charvel. Charvel. Yeah. It's a great bridge. And, yeah. you know, when they came out with my signature model, they could, these weren't made anymore. So we had like an inherent problem. We couldn't put yeah. out a guitar that was exactly like mine. So they tried to take a bridge with fine tuners and just not include the fine tuners. And it just wasn't quite the same. Yeah. And so we had a, like a disadvantage right from the beginning. But yeah, I still have two of these, this one and a white one. What, what pickups have you got in that one? I don't even know. I haven't checked in years. I have this in a case and a closet upstairs. Oh. And I think this is a super distortion. And this might still be the Al Dimiola neck right. I pick up I such, I don't a, know. such an iconic guitar, Vinny. It's just that—that that is my teenage years watching watching oh, wow. that, that, that that VHS. You know, it's, uh, it's such a great guitar. This wasn't even one of the production models, so if you feel the body, you can feel the paint clusters, the clumps. Yeah, because yeah. they actually just threw it on with something, and I don't know how they did the production model ones, but with this, they just flung paint at it in different colors. And it's actually raised. Right. You can feel it. But those, because those production ones are very rare. Yeah, there was only 50 of them. Was it really? Yes. Jesus, because yeah, so. I just picked up, a, I bought a Red Beach. I managed to find one of the uh, the, the, the Koa and Mahogany and Koa Voyagers with the big, mm-hmm. lump, and there's not that many of those. And I, I got it for a really good price. I don't, it was, it, it was, uh, um, uh, the guy who owned it apparently passed away and he had this whole collection of guitars and there's this little uh, uh, antique guitar store, vintage guitar store in Stockholm and they had it there and I snapped it up, original case and uh, I posted a few pictures and people have been going crazy for that but I've been looking at How many out- guitars do you have? You must have tons. Uh, about 70. Wow. I, I don't I, know I what just, I have. I've just got this, Vinny. Nice. So I still I still work with Music Man twenty five years next year. So that look at the look at the back of that one. That's got a flame back on it. That's insane. Yeah. Let me grab one here real quick. Here's the first oh, one. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh well, yeah. This was before they named it the Axis. It yeah. was after Ed was no longer with the company and they were kicking around what are we gonna call oh, this well, guitar? Oh well, so you've got one it of those. So there's nothing on it. Oh, Vinny, you're gonna, se- you're gonna sell me that guitar. <laughs> I'll give it to you for two quid. No way, yeah, because there is that period. I was talking with Derek about this recently, because I've got a Van Halen. And and obviously, since Eddie passed, my collection, I have 15 of these. It's it's gone through the roof. This this is one of 55 that they've just made with the double binding, but they've gone That's back. A, I've never seen that with the yeah, back. Like they've, that. they've gone back to, to the slab body. This one's got like a slab neck joint as well. I'm up, I've only just got this guitar. I've got to do a video with it for, for the, for music man. I, you know, we'll send you a guitar. We'll make a video. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I might do it in my underpants for this guitar. You know, it's, uh, you might have a couple of pints on stage and actually have it backwards and not even know. Yeah. No, yeah notice that you've got on the other side. Yeah. So is that, that purple one that you've got there, is that a slab body? Or has that got a belly cut on it? Um, let me see. Because that's, oh, slab. it's a slab. So yeah, basically that is, they still, they, the, the agreement with Eddie had ended, but there was a, a handful of guitars that they had left over. That is super rare. They were kind of making joke names up the time. And I remember one of the names was exhaling. <laughs> <laughs> like exhaling. No way. You need to take some photos of the, that guitar and share that online. I, my followers would go insane if they saw that. I, Sweet. I didn't know you had that one because I've got, a, I've actually got on my kind of rogues gallery wall over there, I've got a signed photo from you that you gave me when we first, really? yeah, yeah, when we first oh, met. Really? I've got, uh, I've got all the people that I ever met from Music Man. I had your Music Man um, 
promo card and you're holding an mm-hmm. axis on that. I remember that, yeah. Yeah, but you had those really lovely silhouettes as well. Yeah, that was my main guitar back in those days. It's more of us in the Strat family, yeah. the Floyd Rose. And yeah, yeah. So, and from Bucker with two singles. And then also, didn't you play those Talon or Tal something? Yeah, yeah, that was back in the before music, man. I was with Fender. Yes. Came out with this new line called Hard Feel. Yeah. They wanted that they wanted to make more like their modern guitars. Yeah. So yeah. I was like the guy to be playing the modern guitars. So I went with those. You know, I really liked it. It was like a super strat. And then I guess things didn't work out with having the, that line. And so yeah. we discontinued it. And I ended up staying with Fender, but just playing strats. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. For a while. Yeah. So with, am I allowed to ask about Dean? Or is that, is that a. Sure. Yeah. So, because what, you were with them for quite a while. You know, I was with them for like 10 years and it was a really good situation a good experience and there was no bad blood when mm. i left it was just more of a time it was time you know yeah to, to just i had to go out and do something different i was really close friends with the o- owner of the company elliot okay and uh, he even played bass for me on some of my tours and we were really close he's a great guy and he passed away yeah about i don't know five or so years ago it's really sad mm. and his son took over the company and he's a smart kid and I guess doing a great job. It seems like he is. But, you know, it was just a little different without Elliot yeah. there. And also, they seem to be going in the direction more of the metal guys yes. with the crazy shapes. And I'm just not that guy. And I didn't feel like I fit in anymore. Yeah, because you know, I, I thought I had to find a home where I fit in more. Mm, with, you know, yeah. Like, I just never was into the wild shaped guitars and metal thing. Yeah. And, you know. Because I've seen quite a few guys that they had uh, have sort of moved on from them. Even the sort of the the, the whole dime bag thing has sort of, that's Yeah, ended that happened well. after I left. Yeah. So I, I, I've read about it like you, but I don't know yeah. really much about it. Yeah. So we can expect, do you think, at some point then to see a, a, a Kramer signature model somewhere down the line? That will be interesting I to see. I think there's a very good chance. Yeah. Yes, ah, I'll, I'll be excited to get my hands on one of those. So what about amplifiers? I can see there's a lot of um, marshals. Are, 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 oh, you can see that. Yeah. Uh, you know, the one I've been using mostly is this guy. Can you see that? Yes. That's, uh, it's a 1980. It's a JMP 100-watt. Uh, Mark II or whatever you call it. And uh, I bought it, yeah, in maybe 82 or 80, no, actually 84. Right. And I used it. And the first thing that surprised me back in the day, because I came from having amps that were high gain. Mm. And I remember back in the day playing this and it's like, oh, it doesn't quite have the sustain. You turn the preamp all the way up to 10 and there's not enough gain. And, you know, I was told, Everybody uses a tube screamer with these amps. And so it didn't quite work out for me in the beginning. And mm. so it just ended up sitting around. I used it a little bit on the Time Out of C record. And then it just kind of sat dormant for years in my studio. And I decided to plug it in one day. And I was like, wow, this thing sounds amazing. Yeah. Boy, how could I not have known this for all these years? And since then, it's been my main amp here in wow. the studio. Records I've done for probably the past 15 years and you know i just said the preamps on eight right now i usually set the preamp to six yeah so it's a little grit, gritty and then i use a pedal in front of it to push the input right. a little harder to make it sing like Woo! i've just spied a little bit of vinnie moore history as well behind you i've just seen the old laney head Oh, there's two of them down there yeah are they the ars the a or, or were they the uh, the, um, the first one on the right is just one of the standard AOR heads, like a hundred. Yeah. I don't know what happens to the Laney emblem. I, I need to get one of those. The one on the left is a standard AOR fifty watt. That's but uh, they were being distributed by a company in Chicago at the time in America, and uh, they had this local Chicago guy do a modification to it, which apparently enables the usage of. Uh, half of one of the preamp tubes that wasn't being 
utilized in the you know the stock model. So it's got more gain, basically. Yeah. Came the amp I used in the studio around the time of Meltdown. Yeah. I used it on Meltdown. I never took it on the road. It's kind of a... It's an interesting amp. It yeah. does one thing, but what it does, it does really well. I, I have a modification. I had one and I used it for years, the AOR 50. I loved it. Um, and I, the thing I liked about it was that you had, you have all the, the, the pull bass controls and, and the, right. two, and the two master volumes. So I used to, dr- mm-hmm. I used to drive the clean channel and then put, put a rat pedal on the clean channel so I could get a little bit more drive. And then I, I'd, right. I'd back down the gain, but push the volume up on the lead channel. So I had so gotcha. much control, but in the end, I just, I fried it. I was, you know. Did you really? Oh yeah. Playing so many gigs every night with it, sort of the, the, the gain on the clean channel flat out. It's, uh, no um, kidding. Eventually I, uh, I took it to see, uh, uh, an amp repair and he said, basically, well, you've run it so hot. There was part of the circuit board that had actually melted. So, so, so when the amp run for a while, the components would wobble around in their own solder. So, uh, uh-huh. uh, uh, but, but, That's some, great, man. but, but, uh, I, I let it go. I sold it on. I got it kind of fixed up and explained to a guy and he took it off my hands and I really regret selling it now because they, they, they're really great amps for what they do. And this yeah. is like the streamlined version of the AORs because for a while they had like two or three input volume controls for gain staging. Yes. And uh, they streamlined it down to just one preamp and one master, and it became a lot more simple to use then. Yeah. So what what amps do you use then when you're out on tour with UFO? Well, with UFO, I went through a period where I was using an angle head, and, but most of the time I've used a Marshall JCM 2000. Right. Yeah. So do you think that's... And I've, at times I've used it with a pedal in front of it and time at times I've used it with its own distortion too. Yeah. But I never run the gain setting too high. Mm. It's maybe like between six and eight or something like that. So a lot of people like rock players are, will automatically turn that preamp all the way up to 10. Yeah. And I've never been like that kind of guy, it's just kind of easing it back a little bit. So do you think there's a chance you might check out some Mesa stuff now that you're uh, working with Kramer? Oh, it'd be interesting to, actually. Um, I used to have a dual rectifier, and I used that on some of my records over the years, and it's a great sounding head. Mm. Um, it's a, that particular one, I used like the clean stuff, you mm. know, and the halfway distorted things. It had way more mega gain than what I would ever need, unless I was doing a super heavy grunge thing or whatever. It's definitely a high gain amp. Yeah. But I, you know, even just the clean sound of that amp was amazing. I used mm. it on the song and it just sounded marvelous. Yeah. I've got a, I, I have quite a few Mesas now, but uh, the the main one that I've been using in the studio for the videos, especially for the Gibson videos, is the Badlander. Which is like a, it's, it's a, it's a rectifier, but it's, uh, it's got, um, it's got their cab clone, uh, technology built in. So it's got impulse responses. So you can uh-huh. just take an XLR out, stick it straight in, and it just sounds, got all these different, uh, uh I have cabs. impulses too, Beavis, and I want to <laughs> stick it right in. <laughs> See, it came I'm out. Down. It's there. It's made a return. But yeah, you should check that out. That amp is, is really okay. good. It's a really, really good amp. I tried the Mark V once. I went up to a guitar magazine in New York. It was Guitar World and did some instructional stuff. And they had that one there. And I plugged into it and I was able to get a good sound pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're good. They're good amps. So just, uh, uh, following on, uh, from amps and guitars, what about effects? Is there, you know, when you're touring, you're using any multi effects stuff or, or are you using, uh, a, a just pedal based, uh, effects? Just pedal based stuff. And it's always kind of, I'm always trying new things. It's usually a wah. And then sometimes I have a boss, uh, oh, what is that called? It's a, I use it for detuning. It sounds chorusy. Maybe a, I think it's right here. Harmonist PS6. Yes. Yep. 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 I like that for chorusing. I love the detuning yes. thing that yeah. it does. It does. The pedal does all kinds of things, but I only use it for that. Yeah. Like whatever, five cents or detuning. Yes. And uh, there's always two delays on the pedal board one longer repeats, one shorter or closer delay. And, you know, everything else is. Some, I've gotten into higher octave pedals. Like so I have a sub up TC electronic. Mm. I think it's called just for the higher octave. 
you know, and uh, things are always coming in and going out on the pedal, live pedal board. Yeah. There's always got to be a couple delays there, a yeah. chorus, and a uh, for certain songs. Yeah. Okay. And what about um, uh, uh, in the studio? Is it are you miking up cabs, or are you using imp- yeah. imp- you don't use impulse responses and load boxes or anything like that? I actually don't even know much about that. What they are? I mean, I kind of have an idea, but no, it's always miking up cabs. Yeah. Uh, I've been using an analog man KOT a lot uh, for the last few years just to push the input of the Marshall a little harder. Yeah. I have a full tone. Oh God, what's it called? Octafuzz, I think. Yeah. That is really cool that I bought for the higher octave thing. Mm. The Hendrix sound. But I found that by turning that off and just using it as a fuzz, it sounds amazing too. Right. And I've used it mostly for that. I have a J uh, Rocket. What's that called? The Archer? Yeah, yeah, somewhere? yeah, yeah. I, was it JR Rocket or JD yeah, Rocket? Yeah, the, J, the, uh, the J Rockets. Yeah, I have one of their Archer right. pedals, yeah. I'm horrible with remembering the names of my songs and the name of my pedals. And, you know, I have a whole bunch of pedals. I don't know if you can see. My studio is absolutely a mess. I have pedals. Like, oh, wow. Like, yeah. It's, like, it's insane. I've got to organize that somehow. I'll find all the pedals, man. Uh, that's cool. And, uh, yeah, when I'm recording, I'll just think of something. Like, oh, this pedal might be good, and I'll try it out. I'll try two or three things out. And I can usually find what's in my head. Yeah, yeah. Can work. So the new album is mixed. When when do you think that that will drop? Probably May, latest June. Yeah. Who puts your albums out now? This was I a- have my own label. That's, you know, at this yeah. point, doing what I do, it really makes no sense to be on some big label group. Doesn't care about anything anyway. No, you know, I, I've been there. I, I, I spotted the name of the, the, the label. I was like, is Vinny doing his own label now? So is that a you? Yeah, for the past two releases, I've used my own label, Mindside Music. Wow. And this will be the third release. And, you know, that's the best way to do it at this point. So do we expect to see you uh, becoming like a, a, a Mike Varney guru at some point, Vinny, looking for new I might talent? might be a big business exec with a cigar, you know, like, <laughs> hey, play it for Mr. Big. <laughs> No, you know, that's not something I'm really interested in. Yeah. Interested in. It's just a kind of a vehicle to, you know, release my own music. Yeah. yeah. How, how do you, you know, continue to stay so motivated after such a, a long career and continue to put out, you know, you obviously still enjoy making instrumental music, or do you think having the, the, the being a part of UFOs, you can satisfy that part of your, um, desire for playing do you think that what what enables you to keep going having those two things running side by side maybe but also i i don't know what else to do it's all i've ever done what what would i do if i stopped you know it's Mm. i don't know it's crazy it's it's really all i know in my life yeah do you have plans to take the new record record out and play live at some point yeah definitely in fact i have a solo tour in europe coming up in uh, may it was supposed to be in january but all the countries started locking down over there so we had to like postpone it and which will be better it'll be a lot warmer at may so we start yeah. in italy and i think we end in finland maybe yeah i so. know I, I saw you were in finland you're not coming to sweden i know that's a bummer but maybe uh maybe if there's time to uh my, 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 my partner's going out on tour because she's a tour manager, but depending on when it is, I could, I could probably get over it. It's not that far. Hop over a little yeah. puddle jumper. Yeah. What, would it be like hour flight or it's something? It's not even that. Yeah. I could come over wow. and we could hang out. That would be a bit of fun. Okay. Anyway, Vinny, thank you so much for taking the time for, uh, uh, chatting to me. Uh, I know you're very busy. Uh, looking forward to the new record and. Hopefully come over and see you play live and see you on the road with UFO as well. Busy year. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. And, you know, you're a great player. I watch your stuff all the time. Uh, very Seriously. kind. You're very kind. No, just being honest, bro. You play very well. Uh, it's, it's... You've got those long fingers to do those wide stretches. And uh, I, I envy your left hand. <laughs> well, thanks so much. <laughs> can, for... I borrow, can I borrow it for a couple yeah, weeks? you can borrow it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, man. Well, thank you so much, Vinny. And uh, yeah, best of luck for the- with you again. It's been a yeah. long time, man. Yeah. Take it easy, man. Cheers.